So with that, I'd like to invite up on stage Paul from BD. <laughs> So I've prepared a couple of questions, but like I said, I'm quite keen to get your input as well. So start thinking now of what you might want to ask Paul. So I thought we should maybe take a step back to kind of paint the picture really. Where did you come from? Like what's your educational background? Do you want to talk us through that? And sure, yeah, I'm from here originally. My first 20 years was in the UK, uh, Buckinghamshire. And I went to university, I went to Cambridge, undergraduate, and I did a one-year master's at Oxford. And then left the country after that, and I've only just arrived back. So uh, in October, I moved back. I'm living in Cambridge now. And so going through a major culture shock. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I was in Southern Africa for five years. And then I did an MBA in France at INSEAD. Uh, and spent a year in Asia, and then went to the US. and have been for the last uh, 18 years in the US. Uh, I was in Washington DC for three years working for the <coughs> and um, started a business with Ronnie Kahan, who I was with uh, at INSEAD. We started a, a business called Jobs in the Money, uh, which was a financial services job board. Uh, I think yeah, that's, you'll be saving that's oh, another question. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. I wanted to dwell for a couple of seconds on the educational background. I mean, it's fair to say it's extremely solid undergraduate Cambridge, uh, master at Oxford and NCR for your MBA. Uh, I once told someone I want to do an MBA and then do a startup, but he said, why, why an MBA if you want to do a startup? What's your take on um, education versus running a Do you need education to run a startup? Is that good or bad? Is this, did it delay your start or, or, or becoming an entrepreneur? Or what's your take on? I don't think there's a single model. Many people would advocate you should drop out of college as early as possible and start something. I'm sort of the opposite end of the scale where I went through, I did three degrees and 10 years of work experience and had entrepreneurial uh, inclinations quite early on, but didn't really start anything until uh, I was in my 30s. So I think, I don't think there's a single model for success, but I think, you know, I think it, it does work to have experience, it does help. Mm. So you mentioned you were interested in sort of the startup scene. when. Did that manifest itself sort of during your childhood or early teenage years, or when did you get interested in, in startups? Or I would say after, after university, during my first job. When I worked in my first job, I was actually in Botswana. I worked for the National Development Bank there, and um, we were funding businesses, mostly you know, game farms and various agricultural businesses. And I think at that time. I started thinking, well, maybe it's more interesting to, to start your own business. But it took me 10 years before I actually did start a business. So I think that um, yeah, that model obviously worked for me, but it's different for everybody. So dwelling on that a little bit more, like entrepreneurship, is it something that can be taught or is it something that you feel like you probably have within you? Or can you make a distinction it's, between the two? Both. I, think it can, I think the skills can be taught um, and the tools can be taught and business schools are doing that. Uh, but um, yeah, I think the desire is, is, is a little bit difficult to put your finger on, and not everybody has it. And the ability to want to take that kind of kind of risk, I guess it is a risk, um, and the psychological, whatever the psychological profile is, I don't know, but um, yeah, some people have that and some people don't. Fair enough. Uh, and, and you talked about the kind of desire to, 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 to do a startup. What, what motivates you? Why, why did you start thinking in this sort of, this sort of way in terms of... Well, I was working for the IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and uh, I didn't think the big bureaucracy really suited me very, very much in terms of my personality. Uh, but also I saw an opportunity. We were, we were hiring financial analysts, and going, I was going through these stacks of resumes, paper resumes this deep, and thinking there must be a better way of doing this. Monster and Hot Jobs had already been created at that time and were doing quite well but there was no financial, finance dedicated job board. So uh, I talked to Ronnie, who I was at business school with, and we started Jobs in the Money, and that's, that's how it started. And it was a, that was in 98. Um, obviously the internet was, was, was flying high at that point, um, just before the bubble burst. And uh, we managed to get through that and, and sell that business in 2003, and then started Indeed in 2004. You mentioned your colleague, Ronnie, or your, your um, partner in crime, I suppose. Um, a lot of traditional kind of success stories seem to be pairs of two individuals working together. 
is that true? How did that work out? Why did you guys team up and why did you think of IDs together and why him and what made you such a good combination of people? Well, I think we had compliment we do have complementary skills. He's uh, from the beginning he ran the, the technical side, the product side. I was more focused on the client side uh, with both our businesses. So I think we've had complementary skills, but also overlapping I mean, I'm very interested in the product and Ronnie's very interested in the, in the business and the sales side. So I think that um, I think we were both interested in all aspects of the business, but had different a different focus. And I think for many people, um, it's hard to do it completely on your own. Uh, it, it does help to have partners. Um, not just, some people do it with, with one partner, some sometimes it's multiple. But um, you know, to start from scratch completely on your own is, is hard. So it, it this worked for us. So you mentioned the first idea you guys talked about and made made something with was jobs and the money. I, I'm assuming there were other job boards, obviously you mentioned Hot Jobs and Monster, they were catering to some degree, even if it was not specifically for finance uh, roles. What did you, did you have any concerns about doing a, a Me Too product or were you, were, you, were you so confident you would be different or do you have any thoughts yeah, on well, I think the, the whole yeah, Me Too kind of The job board situation? industry is brutally competitive and it has been for a long time. So I think that um, insofar as you can differentiate with a new model, you're going to do better, and I think with with that proven to be true with Indeed, we we were the first to really apply the search model to, to jobs, and uh, that ended up being a much bigger, more successful business than than a job board ever would be. So I think that um, I think you can be successful with a product that is is only slightly differentiated differentiated from others, but it's much much harder. You start you're competing head to head and. It's, uh, you've got to work a lot harder to make it work. If you have a more differentiated product, if it's a model that makes sense, then you're going to be potentially able to build a much bigger business. Yeah, so it's interesting you mentioned uh, doing something that's very different. Today I was actually moderating a, a seminar about group on, uh, a daily deals in the Millibank Tower. Um, and it's, it's like maybe 100, 200 companies sort of represented there. And they were booming maybe two years ago, last year, and now they kind of hit a, a bit of a, a wall, the group on or the group on business. Um, and obviously they're maybe doing a lot of similar stuff. And I asked the, the, the MD of Living Social in the UK, what would compel you to leave and start a new data deal business today? He said, well, it depends how much money you're prepared to put behind that. So he was thinking that as long as you have enough money, you can succeed in acquiring businesses. And that's the thing I want to pick up with you on, because you guys were very lean. So moving on to the Indeed story now, you guys were extremely lean in the beginning, and you didn't raise funding straight away. Do you want to talk us through a little bit your thoughts on bootstrapping and, and how well, that Well, that's right. I think the, the analogy in online recruitment is the big job boards, the Monster and Careerbuilder have spent through a number of years hundreds of millions of dollars a year in advertising, and that's, you know, that's analogous to what you're talking about in, in daily deals. Um, when you're competing head to head and you don't have any product differentiation, you're going to have to spend money. Uh, we came out with a model that was uh, the search, applying the search model. So we were in 2004. Uh, we were the first to launch a, a proper uh, search model for classifieds. Uh, doing this for jobs, we launched in November 2004, um, aggregating millions of jobs from thousands of different sources in the U.S. And then we quickly rolled that out worldwide. We're now in um, 50 more than 50 countries and 26 languages um, and we're the number one job site worldwide without having done any offline, we haven't done any TV or any brand advertising at all. We've done quite a bit of search marketing. Um, we've got 100 million unique visitors a month worldwide. Uh, so, but that's the, the, the reason for that is because we were putting the job seeker experience first, making it as easy as possible for job seekers to find jobs. Um, you really focusing on on job seekers, whereas the job board model is is really putting the interests of the, the clients, the employers first. Uh, so we, we flipped that on its head, and, and that's why yeah, we were, you know, not really geniuses. We were following, to some extent, following the, the Google model. Um, they'd just gone public in two thousand and four, um, but that combination of organic search results that are free, unpaid, including everybody's jobs without charging them, uh, with pay per click advertising. Um, paper performance advertising that yeah, it's a very powerful model in any in any vertical. So you, you were not the first ones to launch an, an, a search vertical <coughs> for jobs, right? Because Simply Hired? No, we were before hired? them actually. Yeah. Okay. So the, I mean, there were some role models out there already or No, I mean there were some precursors like Flipdog 
-hmm. that ended up getting bought by Monster. That was started, uh, I think, in 2000, perhaps, around there. Um, but they never really got a lot of traction. So nobody had really done much with job, job aggregation. And mm -hmm. certainly nobody had really applied the, the, um, the, the kind of model that we applied. So everyone's talking about first moving, uh, mover advantage and stuff. Uh, and I didn't realize that, that you were the first one. I thought there were some more small players doing it and you were kind of trying to do better. How, how much to your success were you put down to being the first in this space? Well, I think it helped. Um, but it's not the only thing. We had a lot of industry knowledge having run a job board before, so I think that helped. Um, we kept very focused. Um, I think that we had a great team. We had some great people. And, uh, you know, in, in the, I think that the, those were the things. We just kept mm -hmm. our heads down, and, and we did. Re we raised uh, $5 million in August 05, so that was about nine months after we started, and that helped us uh, compete as well. And... Um, you know, I, I think it's doing a thousand different things better than your competitors. It wasn't, it wasn't just one thing. Okay. Because I think that after you, you have people like Trovet and, yeah, there's some others doing something similar. Oodle was in one. Oodle, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Um, so they were trying to do what you were doing in jobs, but also doing it for uh, car classifiers as well as for property classifiers. But you guys, you, you sort of focus on jobs only. What was the thinking behind kind of focusing on that specific area? Well, uh, recruitment is the biggest classified vertical. I think that by some estimates, it's more than half of all classifieds. So it's a very big segment within classifieds. And the verticals, are, the different classified verticals are very uh, idiosyncratic. They're very different. So if you're trying to aggregate um, real estate, it's a very different problem to solve than aggregating jobs. So it made sense from a product point of view to focus, and it's, it's a huge market in itself. Because I know that Google Base were experimenting, or Google was experiment, experimenting with something called Google Base, which was uh, their attempt of tweaking the search experience for different verticals. So for example, if you typed in a, a job search on Google, it will present you with additional filtering mechanics to improve that, the relevance and the result. And that came, I think, in 2008, maybe, for recruitment, at least here in the UK. Uh, but then everyone got really nervous. Oh my god, this is the end of the job board. Who needs a job board if Google can do this job already at that stage? Um, but then they parked that. And then I, and at the time I was working for a career builder, actually, so I was familiar with the kind of problems and the concerns from the job board industry. And then I worked in property, and Google launched shortly after that a Google base for properties. And again, everyone got really nervous that this could be the end of property portals. Uh, what's your take on Google's constant experimenting in kind of, are you, have, have you ever been afraid that they were going to be doing what you guys were doing, take away business? My recollection that in the US at least it was quite a bit earlier than that, Google based experiment. It was, it, it was really a failure. I think that one of the lessons is that you, it's very easy to aggregate a bunch of data, but it's not, it's not easy to do it well in a, in a way that makes the user experience effective and get the relevance right and, and make sure it's accurate and make sure that um, you develop a product that, that's very um, uh, useful for, for the user. It's not easy to do. And I think that they, they threw something out there and hoped that it would work and didn't really put a lot of resources behind it and, and then ultimately pulled the plug because it was a failure. But uh, it's not to say they won't do something again, again in classifieds, but I think they've never seen it um, to date anyway as a strategic priority to, to do to do anything in job in job in jobs or classifieds. Um, so no. I mean I think they've they've gone into travel, but travel's a, a bigger uh, piece of the financial pie for Google than 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 certainly jobs is. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm doubtful that they're going to, to do anything. It's also a messy problem to solve. Aggregating jobs is is really, really hard and we've yeah, that's a big part of what we've done, um, developing you know, effective aggregation in, in for jobs worldwide. We've got more than 16 million jobs on our site at the moment. I also heard somewhere that Google actually prefers to have suppliers bid against each other, for example, in the in recruitment space, as opposed to them themselves owning the recruitment space. Is, could that be part of the explanation? That it's, it's healthy for Google to have an ecosystem of people buying keywords or... I don't know if that's the reason because they've gone after other, like travel, mm -hmm. you could say the same thing for that, and they've gone after travel, developing their own product. 
So I'm not sure. I don't think they're afraid of competing. Um, I'm not sure that they're afraid of developing products that compete with with their clients. Um, they do that, but I think they just haven't really gone off the class. Haven't chosen to go off the class. Fair enough. So going back to maybe the journey, the Indeed journey. So we talked earlier about how fa the fact that you guys were bootstrapping in the beginning. Was that a conscious decision, keeping it lean, or was that kind of a fact of consequences? Or what's your again going back and elaborating a little bit more on that? Um, yeah, I think that the, our whole DNA has been bootstrapped. Like our last business we did without funding at all. Uh, with Indeed, we wanted to get as far as possible without raising funding. Obviously, the, the earlier you raise funding, the more you're going to dilute your ownership. So that was definitely part of it. Um, but you know, generally, we've had a we've had a kind of lean approach, and I think most of the successful, the most successful internet businesses have been developed in a fairly lean way. Um, you know, even Google, I think. Google got to profitability, if I'm not mistaken, on about 25 million in capital. So it's um, just pretty m remarkable considering. Mm. So I think it's been a successful model, and, uh, and I think that's you know a lesson for, for anybody that if you can if you can get a long way in a lean way, then you're going to be uh, you're going to have a better chance. So, so you did uh, raise five million dollars after after a while. Well, why five million, and what was the intent, or how you would how were you planning on, or how did you use the money in the end? We wanted to raise as much as possible that would enable us to get to profitability without having to raise another round. In fact, when we so when we raised five million, our investors were very skeptical that this would get us to profitability. We said, no, this is this is all we need. And luckily, we were able to. I think we'd spent about three three to four, and then we broke even in two thousand and seven. Um, so, you know, that worked quite well. And have you? Did you consider to go? Appreciate that you wanted to wait until you started making making money, breaking even. Did you ever think that? Well, why not? Why not raise twenty million? Because we can. We probably could pull it off if you'd ask for it. To go quicker and bolder and yeah. Is that well, something that crossed your mind? And what was it? Simply Hi, who was our competitor at the time, and they raised more than twenty million, and it didn't help them much. I mean, I think that I don't think we really saw a way to deploy twenty million dollars that would have enabled us to do make a quantum leap over what we were doing already. I think that I think it you know, made a lot of sense for us to stay focused and um, grow it that way. And arguably, we could have grown faster if we'd raised more money, but, uh, but it worked well for us. Mm. So talking about growing then, do you want to talk us through a little bit in terms of what steps you took? So you were in, in the US at the time, focusing on the US market. Uh, did you know from the outset that you wanted to go global? Did you, ha what kind of steps did you take? To, to get to that point? Well, I think that one of the first things, we, launching the site was important, and then we uh, improved the site and developed our advertising product. That's what we did before doing anything outside the US. So we developed sponsored jobs as our advertising product, which is analogous to Google AdWords. It's an auction model. Um, ads appear above and below the natural results, and it's pay-per-click. Um, so we did that, and then we launched, I think in Canada was the first country we launched outside the US. Uh, and then the UK, uh, and then we rolled out much more quickly and got up to 50 countries quite fast. Um, I think we always knew that was what we had to do. It was a question. I think that the trade-off is: Do you, you know, at what point do you uh, go international? Um, to what extent should you be focusing on getting more of a lead in the US if you're a US company? Um, so that those are the trade-offs. I think that the, ultimately we knew it was going to need to be a, a global coverage. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, in terms of questions from the audience, would anyone like to kick things off a little bit? I have more questions here, but I'm quite keen to involve you guys. Anything on your mind, gentlemen over there? Hi, Paul. Uh, Aaron Stewart. What was the sort of split of investment from the five million that you raised in respect to <coughs> investing into effectively the, the product, the technology, and the, the, the technical team behind it versus like business development? Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually sort of you know pulling in the pulling the customers because I've spoken to a number of businesses and you get very tech based companies that almost sheepish towards business development and they sort of grow organically and then you get others that are extremely business development driven but then they're not so focused on the product so what was what was your sort of recipe mixture between the two yeah we were very product driven at the beginning well we always we still are we're a very product dri driven company but in terms of the allocation of resources in the early days you know, by far, you know, almost all of it was going to product engineering and product people. Okay. Um, and 
that was really the focus of the organization. And we began to, when we started selling, we started selling to job boards, in fact, uh, not to companies. So we, we had a very focused sales effort. <coughs> um, and uh, uh, to this day, I think it's quite a product-driven company, although the majority of the um, headcount, payroll, and uh, we spend a lot on search engine marketing. So those are the big buckets of spend, is the payroll. Majority of the people are client-facing. Um, and then search engine marketing. We spend millions of dollars a month on search engine marketing. So it's, it's a minority of the spend today, but at that time, um, when we were spending that initial first round, it was majority product. Okay. Thank on, you. on that note, so I've heard some rumors in the industry that maybe Indeed knows someone on the inside of Google because they're ranking so well organically. So sometimes you type in a job title and the first 10 results could be from Indeed. So is that true or not? Did you have no. someone on the inside? Yeah. Or did you no, hire the right person? And not at all, not at all. I, w I wish we had, actually. Yeah. It would have saved a lot of, a lot of effort. But uh, no, I mean, I, we like to think that it's a testament to our product being good. Um, and uh, I think that's true. I think that they do, they're doing a lot of measurement on user behavior. They, they're looking at click-through rates. They're looking at, they've got a, a lot of quality metrics. And we do well. People like Indeed. People when they click through from in, uh, Google to Indeed, um, it's uh, the metrics are good from Google's perspective. So I think that uh, you know I think that's the, that's really the reason um, more than anything else. Mm. Almost because of the nature of your business, aggregating content, I, I would have assumed you get a lot of organic traffic or from Google. I would have assumed. Uh, does that concern you? You kind of dependent on Google's kind of algorithm to sustain your business or? I know Google introduced Google Panda maybe a year and a half ago, which sort of messed up a lot of people's business models. Right. How do you manage Google's whims? Or yeah, changes? well, it's definitely a double-edged sword because if you get a lot of traffic from Google, you know, you expect <coughs> and people say, well, hold on a minute, you're now you're at risk of, of, of losing that. So, and in fact, we did with the, with the Panda changes, we, um, we had some hiccups, uh, but we recovered, fortunately. Almost in, in almost every market, we recovered and now you know it's back to back to where it was or well ahead of where it was but um uh yeah it's a double-edged sword and you can't you can't really get away from that it's yeah. if you don't get that traffic you're, you're losing out but if you do get it there's potential dependence um but uh we our traffic's also been quite diversified we get a tremendous amount of direct traffic now which is which is key so we, we're not really that vulnerable today we were maybe at one point more questions from the audience? Lady over here. And um, regarding Google um, devising a, a model such as um, it's a classified thing, and the, now, for example, if you type in Google France, you get all the information for France before you go into Wikipedia, and maybe the same will happen with jobs, and then there will be sponsored uh, ads on this uh, Google space just uh, when someone is doing a search on Google. And I was wondering how do you, if you think that this is actually a threat to companies such as Indeed? Um, first of all, I'm doubtful that they're gonna do anything in jobs soon. It's hard to do job aggregation and not that sexy and not that interesting to their engineers. Um, so, I, mean, I think it's sexy, but I don't think they do. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I guess the other, the other answer is that they've done this in a lot of verticals and those companies that they've competed against continue to do well. So if you look at Kayak, for example, it's continuing, it's a fantastic business. It's, it's still doing well, even though Google have got quite a nice travel search product. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, you know, Yelp made a lot of noise at one point, um, but they're continuing to do well as a business. So I think that even if Google does go into these things, it's not, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean that the others are going to fail. <coughs> it's, I guess it's fair to say that you guys also produce maybe your own content to some degree, whereas Google, they seem to be staying away from that in terms of producing maybe reviews or, would that be correct or would that be Yeah, something? Indeed's now the number one uh, site on the web for company reviews, which is, which is fantastic and you know, nobody else is really focused on that to the same extent. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I think Google's been more focused on uh, on local local you know, local content, but um, we'll see how it evolves. 
Another question over here? Yeah, hi, Tom Savage from Three Desk. Um, how did you drive traffic uh, at the very beginning? And would you use the same methods today if you start the game? We uh, didn't spend money uh, in the early days, not certainly not significantly. We focused on getting the product right and making sure it was you know, friendly to search. And so we had a lot of organic search traffic in the early days, and we still do. I think it's harder now because everything's gone mobile. So the, I think the, the rules of the game have changed a bit. Um, having said that, we our mobile products are doing really well. We, we're the number one job search app on Android, um, iPhone, and iPad. Um, so we've had to adapt. But I think if you're starting, um, if you're starting today, you're going to be having, you're going to be thinking about mobile up front and centre to a much greater extent than uh, it didn't really exist in, when we started. Um, so that's the big change, I think. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear your views of those of the audience. You probably know more than I do. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's complimentary. So, how did you get your first data? Just familiar with the model of aggregation, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Also. Well, there's two ways we aggregate jobs. One is we take feeds, so anybody that's got an XML feed of their jobs, we can take it. Um, we also go out and index sites directly. So, um, you didn't have any issues with uh, copyrights and, uh, and uh, no, I mean, I think that every site is different, so we you have to you have to create a unique crawler for each site. Um, the, there isn't really a copyright issue because the content's created by the by the employer. Um, so if anybody had an issue, it would be the employer. But it also, it's not really creative. It's not really a creative work. So I don't think there's any copyright issue. There, are, there is in terms of service issues. Technically, you know, it, arguably you're breaching terms of service, um, but you're delivering a lot of value to those sites, including job boards. So we partner with with all the major job boards and minor, you know, and niche job boards. Uh, we're driving a tremendous amount of organic traffic. Um, we're also, uh, many of them are our clients, so they're, they're paying for traffic from us. So we've had situations where job boards have been reticent about working with us, um, and then they've, they've changed their position. So Monster, for example, uh, had a, quite an ambivalent view towards us in the US for many years. But now they're a paying client, so that we've found over time that it's you know become easier and easier to to work closely with the job boards. Yeah, how do you on that note then? How do you manage that relationship? Uh, so in the beginning you were offering monster traffic, and now you also employ salespeople to make some resell against monster. How do they feel about you now? Are they less excited about working with you, or I think it's have a, to keep it I going it's now? A, yeah, it's a relationship of cooperation. It's, there's always this, you know, there's been some ambivalence over, over the years. Um, <laughs> but there are three important ways that we provide value to job boards. One is the organic traffic, the other is them sponsoring their jobs. And the third one, I mentioned both of those two. The third one I didn't mention is uh, backfill. We provide, <coughs> through our API, sponsored jobs to job boards. Uh, they backfill their listings, and we share the, the revenue with, the, with those publishers. And that's a very important source of revenue uh, for job boards and also it gives their users a better experience. So uh, then, you know, we're working <coughs> very closely with job boards and um, although we're also, as you say, we're competing in terms of selling, there's a, um, you know, you know, there's a um, certain amount of recruitment advertising dollars that, uh, that we're competing for. And, uh, you know, I think that the many industries are like that though, where you, in some respects you compete, in other respects you cooperate um, so it's yeah it's not a simplistic relationship. Fair enough. I think it's a question of the gentleman in the white shirt, yeah. Um, nine years of sort of peak performance in a fast growing startups as a CEO, uh, how do you motivate yourself to continue at such a high pace for all these years and also now that you have exited, how is that changing and you know, do you What's your plan to manage that? So yeah, I, I think it's um, uh, you know, we we were going to go public if we didn't do this transaction. So that was a really tough decision. We were on that path, um, and 
we were a very attractive company to the public markets. Uh, and then we had this offer and we, were, we negotiated with, with Recruit. Um, and uh, you know, so that, those were the two paths. And I think that by doing, going this path, it's enabled me to be in the situation I am now, which is, going to, which is obviously very different from, from being CEO of a public company. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm still uh, still alive, and and uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, I don't think it was hard to keep motivated. I think that um, I think it's exciting when you're involved in something that's growing very fast. I, I think it's more a question of how do you keep a balanced life, and how do you you know make sure you your family's happy, and you're sort of still taking vacations and um, trying to keep sort of some semblance of normality. I think I don't think there's a an issue about getting bored when you're in a fast growth environment. Another question over there? Hi, Andrew Hunter from Azuma. Um, how important was it for you to be based in the US throughout Indeed's life? If you were to turn black the clock and, and launch, uh, say, 2004, could you do the same thing from London or Cambridge, or did you feel like you had to be in the US? Yeah, it would have been, a, I mean, I, I don't think I could have done what I did from from anywhere else other than the US, because it, it's very much a US business. Um, and uh, the vast majority of our employees are in the US, and that's where all the focus was. And um, still 80% of the revenue is in the US. So, I mean, it would have been a different business, I guess, if, if, if I hadn't been there. Um, would that be a recommendation to startups to go to the US or? No, I, I don't think so. I think you just, you, it's just going to be a different business. Um, you know, it's just one of your the things we talked about earlier was um, what business opportunities there are now. And I think financial services, obviously, in London is, is a huge industry. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there to, to leverage what you know, the environment has that you're in. And I think that you, you come up with different businesses depending on where you're located to some extent. Other questions from the floor? Gentlemen in the middle, yeah? Hi, um, I'm Dee from We Want Play. Um, I have a two-part question. So I'm a product of the Birmingham-based accelerator where we have access to a large number of mentors, including the gentleman sitting next to you. So how important were the mentors in your business and how you use them? And the second part of the question is, Gladwell will say that um, business is grown by showing different events. So were there such events that really helped you grow because you're a big business, but you always had that little bit of help to reach out? So I don't think we had a lot of mentors. I think that Ronnie and I have worked very closely together from the beginning. So I think if you have a close 50-50 partnership and you found a business, you probably need less input from, from outsiders. I think maybe if you're doing it on your own, you need more external input. So we sort of were quite, um, work very closely together. Uh, we had good investors though. We had Union Square Ventures was our investor. Uh, venture Capital Investor, New York Times was another one. Uh, so those, those guys were very helpful to us. Um, I don't know if I'd call them mentors, but yeah, we, work, we work closely with them. Um, so what was the second part of your question? Um, were there a number of key events that you didn't plan to happen that helped your business grow? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure about that. No, I think that we were quite lucky in that we managed to execute the vision that we had and I, didn't, I can't think of too many examples where something came out of left field and gave us a, a huge opportunity that we, we wouldn't otherwise have had but I'll give that some more thought. Other questions? Yeah. Are you okay? Sorry I, I don't know all the history but um, so there was just five million investment from those two investors you just mentioned and, and then you got to profitability and then you just funded the business through. Correct. Yes. I was looking on Twitter and no one's posting questions. So I guess everyone's happy <coughs> asking them away here. So that's good. Jump over here. Well, just a tactical question. Did you, when you rolled out internationally, have to do local T's and C's in the local geographies, or did you just always stick with a, a centralized legislation in the T's and C's? Um, well, that's a very specific question. I think I think that when we first started we 
you know, we just took the risk and put something out there with a, with a, I'm not sure we worry about it too much from the day we launched, but over time we're getting more sophisticated and getting more in tune with, I mean, I think that we've been un, under the radar in, in many markets. And I'm not sure that, um, uh, you know, we haven't been a, a magnet for attention from regulatory authorities in, in anywhere, really. Uh, but obviously, as we get bigger, we've got to be more careful. So particularly since we've launched resumes, there's obviously a, a lot more a focus on use of personal information. And we've got a, a general counsel in-house now that we've had for a year or so. Um, so that's, you know, that was new at the time. So we, you know, obviously, as we get bigger, we focus more on these things and try to make sure we're in compliance with, uh, with local law. And I think to a large extent we are, if not <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions from the floor? Gentleman in the back. Um, just wondered how influential socials become, social leaders become, and has it helped companies make more sense of our big data, or kind of avalanche of information that everybody's having now? So two buzzwords in one Sorry. there. <laughs> social <laughs> media and big data. I, I don't know, um, you know, most people would say job search is not social. Um, there are social aspects to what we do. For example, we have uh, ratings and reviews. And I mentioned before that we're the number one um, review site on the web for, for employers. Um, a lot of people would say Yelp is a social service. So I'm not sure why Yelp would be and we wouldn't be. But you know, it's kind of a fuzzy, a fuzzy term. So I'm not sure really how to answer that. I think that we don't, you know, we don't get a you know, traffic is not driven um, from social sites like Facebook and, and others, Twitter. I don't think a large percentage of our traffic originates from, from those places. Um, but uh, you know, data is really important for us, obviously. Uh, just like <coughs> many, many sites, we have a tremendous amount of data, so we're looking at that all the time. And our search algorithms are, uh, to a large extent, uh, um, you know, they're adjusted for user behavior. So we look at what people we look, we look at what people click on. We look at what jobs they apply to, and um, improving our relevance algorithm. Personalization is an important initiative moving forward for us, and a lot of that's uh, based on on data. So that's a big part of what we do. Gentlemen, back houses. You mentioned uh, you were the largest job site with uh, the largest number of recommendations for employers. So one. Did what was that planned? And secondly, how did you go about um, making it happen? I mean, what incentives were you giving to, to the end users to leave those recommendations? Well, I think it's a function of we created a nice, simple product for it, um, and then we, um, you know, we, we we put that in front of our our, our users. And we have you know, 100 million <coughs> visitors a month now to the site, so it's a it's a fire hose of of, of visibility and. Um, and it's you. I mean, it's useful. People, people find it useful, and people are very willing to share their experiences. So I think that it's not different from other other verticals. User-generated content has has been successful for us. Question here on the side. We talked about the contrast between the U.S. and and the U.K. Do you think the U.K. government is doing enough to help startups in this country? Well, I know there's a lot of focus uh, uh, and talk. Um, and, and initiatives as well. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you might be able to answer that better than I can. I think that um, I think it seems quite complex to me. I guess would be my just almost as an outsider's view because I haven't been operating in this market. That I would rather just see a lower tax rate. <laughs> Corporate tax rate. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you, I think that. Um, this, this country has really lost out to uh, Ireland in attracting U.S. internet businesses to put their European resources, <coughs> and it's quite you know it's, it's quite tragic in a way uh, to see if you're British anyway to see Dublin just gobbling up every European headquarter of, of you know Google, Facebook. You can just go down the list. Salesforce. <laughs> Salesforce, and it's primarily because because just the corporate tax rate is lower. And you can set up, you know, a double, double Irish structure <coughs> with an offshore IP, and 
you know, we've done the same thing, I and mean, it's it makes sense to do that as a company. And um, you know, instead of complaining about companies avoiding taxes, you should just you know lower your tax rate and <laughs> make sure you attract those businesses because the value to the company of attracting those businesses is is far far higher than you know any sort of lost taxes from from having a lower tax rate. So it's kind of short sighted. That would be my you know I would rather see the government doing that than you know, matching Ireland's corporate tax rate than doing any number of, of sort of micro initiatives. But maybe I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> How have you uh, protected your IP and what has your experience been of putting those protections in place? When you say protect, how do you mean? Patents, things like that. Oh, I see. Um, we haven't done a lot of that, actually. Okay. We haven't done a lot of that. I think we took a... In the early days, we decided not to get too distracted by that. And then we've continued uh, to try not to be distracted by that. We do have... Uh, we have been hit by patent trolls from time to time that we've had to, to deal with. Um, but in terms of creating a portfolio of defensive patents, we haven't we haven't spent a lot of time doing that kind of thing. Um, and uh, hopefully the the environments certainly in the U.S. is moving in a direction that that is less favourable now to to patent trolls. On that note, actually, your name indeed. Maybe this is a stupid question, but. Isn't that very difficult to trademark? Because I find myself using it every other day, and I'm thinking about you, and I say it, and it feels a bit weird. Like, what, what a powerful name that was. Was that? Well, the trademark is linked to what you use it for. So you can, I mean, you could set up a a pizza shop called Indeed, and mm -hmm. even if we have a a trademark on Indeed, oh, yeah. it's related to jobs and job search and recruitment, and it's only protectable insofar as it's <laughs> somebody's using the name for that. I, I'm not a, I'm not a um, intellectual property attorney, so <laughs> others in the audience probably know more than I do, but uh, I think that's... Makes sense. Uh, Questions? How important was your jobs and the money experience to making Indeed.com succeed? So another way of uh, phrasing the same question, how important was the sector experience? It could even you have been as successful in another classified ad sector? No, I think it helped enormously, because we knew all the idiosyncrasies of the, of the industry. And Ronnie and I and I had had this history of working together in this industry for five years, and in a in a kind of a bootstrap a bootstrap environment. And I think it helped. I think it helped a lot. It gave us a lot of runway to be able to to implement Indeed very fast. It's not to say you know it has to be obviously it doesn't have to be done like that in every case, but I think it can be helpful. So you know, I've got a, a list of um, tips, and one of them for entrepreneurs, and one of them is do what you know. Um, so, which would, would be consistent with that. More questions from the floor? How did you find your best people when you were building your team? Well, it, it depends on the, on the sector. Uh, for uh, product and engineers, uh, almost all of them are in Austin, Texas. And so we've tapped into the community there, particularly the University of Texas. Um, we've got a lot of people from there, from from technology companies locally, like Trilogy, for example. Um, we have some quite uh, quite a lot of our senior people have had experience there. So that's on the engineering and development side, um, product side, and then for sales, we've uh, our <coughs> front facing uh, area is in the Northeast. It's in um, Stanford, uh, New York. Those are our biggest. Uh, areas, uh, locations, and we've got a lot of people there, not just from the recruitment industry, but also from other industries, but a lot of people with online e-commerce experience, people who understand the internet, um, but quite a few from job boards as well, so it depends on the on the sector. And on that note then, so obviously a lot of startups around California, San Francisco, they're, they seem to be fighting a lot over talent. Is, was that another benefit of being in Texas, where there's less, maybe a fight for, for the best people? Yeah, that's... I mean that's definitely true. It's um, it's I think it's very very hard to attract good people in the valley. There's obviously a much bigger pool of people, but the competition is is fierce. So I think it definitely helps us having a unique uh, presence in Austin, Texas. More questions? We're time for a few more. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Jill Story. Do you think you'd do the same thing again now, um, in terms of your point after being through it twice, or would you um, be an advisor to other startups and other businesses and um, in terms of your future roles? Um, sorry, are you saying if I was... Per personally, in terms of where you got to now, would you, in terms of your next challenge, what would oh, that I see. be? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sort of happy what I'm doing at the moment. I think that, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'll talk to you later. Okay. <laughs> In a year's time, I'm not sure. I think okay. that, um, yeah, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I think it's a nice theme to maybe sort of end the evening on, sort of looking ahead a little bit. You talked earlier when we talked about um, technology waves and that when you kind of started Indeed, I was writing a wave about pay-per-click and Web 2.0, etc. What trends now with your job industry kind of experience what trends are you seeing now? We've talked about big data and social and mobile. If you were starting something new today, which area, what trend would you be, what technology way would you be latching onto? Well, I think in vertical search, there's still a lot, of, a lot of opportunities. So things that are not well indexed by general search engines, uh, particularly if you can um, apply a mobile experience to that effectively, I think there's a lot of opportunity. In terms of Industries, I think, um, you know, education, training, healthcare are huge industries that haven't been uh, well disrupted by uh, by the internet. I think that um, financial <coughs> services is another one I mentioned. So I think that there's a huge amount of opportunity. I think there's always a tendency, it's human nature to think that you know all the important things have been done, um, but I think it's a myth. I think that you know I think it's still still early days in terms of the impact of the internet on business. Good stuff. One final question. Green tea, green sweatshirt. Your thoughts on startups like TaskRabbit and the share economy? So I don't know TaskRabbit. Well, I think that I think there's a lot of opportunity in um, uh, temporary uh, work, project work. Um, I think I don't know. I, I, I won't answer TaskRabbit specifically. I don't know that service well, but I think that. I think that there are a lot of interesting models around work um, that aren't just simply enabling people to to get um, conventional jobs. So I think I think there's I think it's an interesting area that whole you know how can how can work be reinvented using the internet? But it's not an area I I've, I've delved into a lot. There was one other question and jumping over here. The question that's theme of the night. How did you make the one billion dollar exit? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, the the price is was not disclosed. Is not disclosed. That's not disclosed. Not disclosed. <laughs> As reported in the media. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I kept telling you to delete it yeah. because it's not. <laughs> it was the sort of the pulling. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> it was a good. It was a good exit for us. And uh, as I was saying earlier, we were on a path to to go public, and this offer uh, came along, and we negotiated and. Yeah, it was a good. It was a very good outcome for everybody. Good valuation, good multiples. Um, so, you know, I think it was. You know, it's good for the business. It's a. It's a. It's a great owner as well. They, uh, very supportive in terms of enabling us to continue doing what we were doing before, um, allowing us to run the business autonomously. Um, in terms of the specific relationship with Recruit, we were actually introduced by Morgan Stanley. Um, they we ended up retaining them as our banker in the deal, and um, so that was. But it was we didn't run an auction. We didn't go out and, and try and find competitive bids. We just ended up negotiating with the one with the one acquirer. Yeah, jumping in the back. Yeah, um, maybe what percentage of the business did you give away on the initial five million funding, and how did you go about? Um, that's one of the things we, I don't think we've ever really disclosed that, but um, uh, it's just us, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think you, know, you, you start disclosing things after a you know, certain number of years, or, or probably not. So, but it, it was a minority stake, and um, but a substantial minority stake. Um, and uh, what was your other question? How, how do you go about deciding on that figure? Mm -hmm. Is it based on turnover? You know, I think that um, VCs typically want to see a percentage stake that makes their, you know, time and attention worthwhile. So that it's unusual; it would be unusual in a first round to 
you know, the Series A to sell 5% it would be, I mean, maybe you can do that now. Maybe if you're a sexy enough business, you can do that, but that would be very unusual. So there's a certain sort of um, percentage interest that VCs typically want to target. And then it just becomes a negotiation. Well, you say, you say well, if you want 20% of the business or 30% of the business or whatever it is, then I won't, you know, I'm not going to do the deal unless my pre-money is X, and typically, you know, they want you to have, as a, they want the founders to have a big enough stake that you know, even if there's subsequent dilution with with you know, Series B, Series C, etc., you've still got you know an interest in continuing to make it successful. So that that's kind of the game. I'm not, you know, I, I don't think that's really changed. Um, but you, so you sort of want to get as much money as you can for as as little. <laughs> now, there's also a timing trade-off because the longer you wait, um, if you can carry on building value, you can you can you can set, you can get more money for for a given percentage sale. Uh, but then you you can maybe sacrifice opportunity. You may you may lose out to the competition. And so it's a it's a juggling act. Are you creating something yourself? <laughs> Another question here. Sorry, did you get other offers for your business before you sold? Um, not as concrete. I mean, I think we, you know, it's not like we had dozens of offers over the years that we turned that we turned down, which was um, it's a good thing. I mean, I think that um, it's quite distracting you know, unless you end up doing a deal and you don't want to be spending your time talking to to buyers and even investors. You know, it can be very distracting. Did uh, the acquirer uh, come out of the blue, or did you have already a long-lasting relationship with? It was that, um, I mean, it was Morgan Stanley made the introduction. Ah, okay. Um, so no we didn't really know them, but we knew of them. Um, it's um, big. It's the biggest HR services company in Japan. They have about ten billion in revenue, so it's quite a substantial. It's one of Japan's biggest private businesses. Um, so it's a substantial business. Do we have a question over here? Or? Yeah. A question about the job board industry, really, and obviously yourself, LinkedIn, etc., have been quite disruptive and changing how it's going. Um, what do you see as the future for the job board industry? So I think that uh, paper performance is going to become, paper click is going to become more and more important. I think at some point, job boards are going to have to potentially ad ad adapt their um, pricing model. I think search is 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 important. You know, having giving job seekers a comprehensive job search experience is hard. I think for job job boards to compete if you've got a very limited universe of jobs. So I think they're going to somehow have to adapt. I think that um, resume databases are going to become open. Uh, we've got an open, I don't, even LinkedIn, you, I was on LinkedIn the other day and it said you've got to become a member and sign up and pay in order to view this person's profile. I said, well, why, why, should you, why should you have to pay to, to see someone's resume or profile? It doesn't make any sense. So. I think those m models are going to get disrupted. It's going to become more open. Um, you're going to get more for free than you did before. Paper performance. I think companies are going to get better and better at tracking, better at measuring the ROI on whatever they do online. And so, unless you've got a something that's measurable and ideal, ideally a paper performance pricing model, it's going to be harder and harder to compete. So I think you know, job boards are going to have to adapt somehow. Did it? Um, I'd like to ask you, um, Indeed operates in 50 countries around the world, I think you said. What kind of adaptations have you had to make to the business model to take it around the world so that it's um, geographically appropriate for the different territories you operate in? We have a, a big uh, international team in Austin that localizes, that localizes the product and also does local marketing. Uh, and we actually have done quite well keeping that team all in one place in Austin. We hire natives of those countries, but locally in Austin. So we have you know French people running the French market and localizing the product and so on. Um, we uh, uh, location search is is a tough one. You know that's different in every every country. So in in the UK you've got counties and uh, uh, what do you have? towns and counties and things. In the States, you've got states and cities and I don't know. It's different in every country, right? So that's hard. Um, 
uh, obviously the language is different. So there's a lot of localization that, that takes place. But ba the basic model is the same and makes sense in every country. So having comprehensive search and a pay-per-click model is, um, um, is something that makes sense in every country. We've done well in, in, in almost every country. China's the only one that we haven't really made a lot of headway in along with every other internet business. <laughs> One final question. Uh, I have a few. Do you crawl the web automatically? No, I mean not in the same way that general search engines do. We don't uh, you know, have one yeah. crawler that goes out. And it's every site's different, so we have to do custom things for for every site. Okay. And have you ever heard of Kahoot? I have. You have? Yeah, yeah because um, we come, I come from Croatia, and my friend, um, my name is Tomas, and um, it was, it's a great inspiration for you, actually. Because, yeah, because we have the same setup and the same thing. You're a competitor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't call it cooperative competition. <laughs> Great, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for your time, Paul. We really appreciate that. So I think a round of applause for Paul. Please don't try to attack him. <laughs> You'll be mingling, so give him space and, and let him speak as many as possible. But yeah, we're going to be reconvening in the bar in the area outside this room. So thank you very much again. Thank you, guys. <laughs>